This week on Brian Ross Investigates, a house of horrors, the New York City Rikers Island prison, a lawless place where guards run so-called fight nights. They will give us compensation like cigarettes or drugs or food and stuff like that to like do stuff to other inmates. Last incident that I had, I knock a guy out and I pee on him, but see he'll pay me to do it. Horribly overcrowded, and now a new expose about the more than 15 deaths in the last year inside the walls of this despicable place. Rikers Island has been a national embarrassment. It is a stain on our city. Plus, the legal troubles for Donald Trump continue to mount. A criminal grand jury now investigating in Georgia and demands for his children to tell what they know. David K. Johnston is here with the latest. And this week's winners and losers in the media. See if you agree with the choices made by the editors of Mediaite. But these vaccines, these mRNA vaccines, the mRNA COVID vaccines need to be withdrawn from the market now. No one should get them. No one should get boosted. From the studios of the Law and Crime Trial Network in New York City's Herald Square, this is Brian Ross Investigating. Good evening, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to our friends on Facebook Live. I'm Brian Ross, joined, as always, by my colleague, Rhonda Schwartz. And, Rhonda, we begin tonight with a disturbing story about a true house of horrors, the giant New York City jail, Rikers Island, a filthy, lawless, overcrowded place that the new mayor of New York has rightly called a national embarrassment and a stain on the city, Rhonda. That's right, Brian. And most of the 5,000-plus people held there are only awaiting trial. They haven't been convicted of anything, but their lives are in danger virtually every hour of every day, Brian. Set on a 400-acre island near LaGuardia Airport in New York City, Rikers Island is one of the world's largest and no doubt worst city jails. And even the repeated exposés of what happens inside the walls here, like this video of a so-called fight night, organized by the gangs, overlooked by the guards, have not led to any serious reforms. The fight night video was obtained by the New York Times, and New York Channel PIX11 talked to one of the inmates who says he was forced to participate. They will give us compensation like cigarettes or drugs or food and stuff like that to like do stuff to other inmates. Last incident that I had, I knock a guy out and I pee on him, but see, he'll pay me to do it. It is a lawless place where prison gangs, not prison guards, seem to be in charge. Investigative reporters at the New York Post obtained photos from inside, showing as many as 26 men stuffed into single cells. The New Yorker magazine documented how one young man got lost in the system, held in solitary confinement for almost three years without a trial for allegedly stealing a backpack. He later committed suicide. Rikers Island has been a national embarrassment, and we have ignored it. And for far too long, and the situation there has been unacceptable. It is a stain on our city. And now New York Magazine has done its own deep dive, documenting how some 15 inmates died at or shortly after leaving Rikers Island last year alone. And we're joined now by the two journalists from New York Magazine who did that incredible article, Bliss Broyard and Lisa Reardon Seville. Thank you both for being here. Let me start by asking you, who were these men who died and, and how did they die? Well, um, the men ranged from age 24 to 64. Um, 11 out of the 16 that died in New York City custody this year, all but one at Rikers, had mental illness issues or addiction issues. And they died in a variety of ways. In many cases, a factor was the uh, there wasn't adequate staff to attend to a medical emergency or to provide a suicide watch in the case where people were um, at risk from self-harm. So these are people that really are in need of services more than they're in need of sitting in jail. And Lisa, these are men who, for the most part, uh, were awaiting trial or just there for sort of technical parole violations? 
Yeah, and that's true at Rikers across the board. Some 95% of the people incarcerated on Rikers Island are pre-trial, so they have not yet been convicted of the crime that they were arrested for. But for many, particularly during COVID, that extended for weeks, months, and even years. Incredibly overcrowded, horrible conditions that you documented uh, through these uh, 15 cases. Uh, Take me through some of them, Bliss. Javier Velasco... um had been in and out of Rikers about seven different times in the last 10 years. And he was a a son of immigrants. A man the reporters found who struggled with alcohol addiction, accused of domestic abuse. So the last time that he went in, he said that he was going to kill himself. And he told the arresting officer, um, he told his wife, Amanda, she told the parole officer, she told the assistant DA, the DA's boss, And they all said that he was manipulating her, you know, that not to take it seriously. So he did have a suicide attempt um, in Rikers that he was cut down from. He was rescued kind of just in time. He was moved into suicide watch. And for some reason, um, perhaps because of staffing shortages, it, it only went on for 24 hours. And then when the suicide watch was removed, he was successful. And Lisa, you found the same thing with the cases you've been looking at closely. Yeah, there are resonances between um, Javier Velasco's story and that of Issa Abdul Karim. Locked up for what is called a technical parole violation, failing to report to his parole officer. He had compromised health. And when he was at Rikers, this was a time when um, intake was very crowded, sleeping really one on top of another, and he contracted COVID. And He was uh, in the infirmary on and off. At the time, the New York governor had signed a law ordering the release of those held on such technical parole violations after 30 days. And he had been there just short of 30 days. So he was not eligible for release. And on his 32nd or 33rd day, Issa Abdul Karim died of a pulmonary embolism linked to his COVID. Um, So this is a story in which this is a man with serious health issues and was not there on a serious charge, and he died there. Your excellent reporting is not the first time that journalists have taken a hard look at Rikers Island, yet the place is still open for business, crowded, a house of horrors. Why isn't anything done about it? Well, um, you know, it has a very powerful union for their correction officers um, who are invested in having a a large staff. Um, So the union, for example, has not been supportive of um, Mayor de Blasio and now Mayor Adams' commitment to close Rikers and move to smaller borough-based jails, because part of that plan also requires decarceration. But Lisa, is it also fair to say that there is a kind of public apathy about what goes on in jails and prisons? There's not a push to reform from the public. We tend to feel that if someone ends up in a jail or prison, they should be there. And we're not always concerned about why, whether or not they did that crime um, or, or what happens to them there. And when the fears of rising crime come up, we tend to revert very quickly back to lock them up, throw away the key. So um, I think that there's a, There's a question as we are dealing with the ravages of a pandemic with a very complex social moment to look back and ask, um, who are we mad at? Who do we want to punish? Who are we afraid of? And also what kind of society do we wanna have? And if we ask those questions, we have to look at our jails and prisons. Well, Lisa Reardon Seville and uh, Bliss Broyard, thank you so much and uh, terrific reporting and they brought a real sharp spotlight on a very serious, uh, long-standing issue. Thank you both for being with us here tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Up next, the legal troubles of the former president. He calls it a political witch hunt. We'll get a reality check from a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. 
you can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV. For all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs, subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. It's been just over a year now since President Donald Trump became the ex-president and a private citizen, ending any official immunity he may have enjoyed while in office. And now prosecutors and investigators are circling. He calls it a political witch hunt. And because the investigations in New York, Washington, Georgia, and elsewhere are ongoing, it can be hard to evaluate what jeopardy he may really be facing. So, to get a reality check, we're joined tonight by David K. Johnston, a good friend, the Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter who has chronicled the business affairs of Donald Trump for decades in a series of books, the latest called uh, The Big Cheat. David, welcome to the program tonight. How much jeopardy does Donald Trump now face? Oh, he's in serious, real trouble at long, long last after. Uh, spending essentially more than half a century swindling people, refusing to pay workers, cheating investors, cheating governments. Uh, the, the biggest concern he has to have is with the Manhattan grand jury, because those are criminal charges. And I anticipate that there will be a New York State racketeering charge brought against him eventually. Uh, the most immediate news issue has been about the New York State Attorney General, who's an elected official who has inherent civil, but not criminal authority. She can have criminal authority in some cases, but this is a civil proceeding. She filed a 115-page brief documenting frauds by Donald Trump and said, essentially, we are now moving on to other fraud. Uh, and this was in support of her subpoenas to require Donald Trump, Don Jr., and Ivanka to come in and testify as second son Eric did when he repeatedly took the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination. And David, in Georgia, the prosecutor there has now been given permission to impanel a grand jury, but not until May. What's the case down there? Well, the Fulton County District Attorney, whose district is essentially the city of Atlanta, is pursuing uh, Trump's efforts under in violation of both state and federal law to rig the outcome of the election. Uh, Brad Raffsenberger, a Republican who was the chief elect elections official in Georgia, has said he would testify, but only if he was subject to a subpoena. He wasn't going to come in voluntarily. The delay is a little troubling because Republicans in the legislature have talked about enacting a new law to prevent this investigation from going forward. And David, a question for you uh, from Rhonda Schwartz. Rhonda? Donald Trump has been complaining bitterly that the attorney general has been targeting his children. The children are 40 years old. Ivanka Trump worked as a White House advisor. Why is she naming them? What is the role? What is their role in this affair now? Isn't it amazing that uh, Donald refers to his middle-aged kids as children? I certainly wouldn't do that with my middle-aged kids. Um, Don Jr. was is the sole trustee of some of the Trump businesses, and he's been actively involved in managing uh, the Trump business at a time when they made just outrageous claims. Uh, for example, there's a piece of property Brian and I have talked about in the past, a Westchester golf course that in one form Trump has said is worth $1.3 or $1.4 million dollars. But in documents to banks, more than 100 million in this presidential disclosure forms, he checked the top box, more than 50 million. Uh, you know, you could argue 1.3 million to 2 million, and that's a range. But if you're claiming 50 and 100 million in other forms, then the 1.3 million it clearly suggests uh, fraudulent behavior. Ivanka was apparently the point person in negotiating with the banks. And in New York State, we have very strong business records laws. Lying to a bank, falsifying business records is a serious crime in New York State. And that's why she would be on the witness list. And by the way, when they come in, I would expect uh, uh, Donald Trump, Don Jr., and Ivanka to rely heavily on their Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. 
David, as you know, prosecutors often use potential charges against children as leverage against the bigger target. Yeah. Is that going to be the case here, do you think? Oh, they're very definitely trying to split up the family on these issues, which is a standard tactic. Uh, the interesting thing will be uh, what goes on with Donald. Even with his family, loyalty to Donald is a one-way street. <laughs> and intensely close as he is to Ivana, Ivanka, uh, I think if push comes to shove, he'll break with her. Uh, and he certainly won't have any difficulty breaking with his sons where, you know, we have recorded examples of where he has referred to them as being idiots and incompetents and other uh, negative terms. What do you think now is the timetable for potential charges in uh, the New York case in Manhattan? Well, the prosecutors in New York were expecting a million pages of documents. They got five million pages. They have to go through and not just look at, but really analyze all of those records, lest something unexpected appear out of nowhere in the trial. So this is going to take some more time. Uh, the grand jury that originally sat asked to be released, uh, and a new grand jury has been impaneled. Uh, but I would uh, expect that we're going to see something sometime this year. Uh, the phrase I've used in the past, and people said it's about to happen, uh, is simply, we're getting closer. Every day, we're getting closer. We keep hearing that. He calls a political witch hunt, but it doesn't sound like a witch hunt. It sounds like they've got a very solid basis here to continue to investigate. Well, if it is a witch hunt, they've got themselves a witch. <laughs> uh, you know, D Donald's record of lying, cheating, stealing uh, is something I've been chronicling uh, from the, the public record since 1988. And what's really astonishing is how he's gotten away with all of this. And it goes to a fundamental law and crime problem in America. Uh, we have very tough rules on people who commit street crimes, as in uh, Rikers Island, where just technical violations of your, your parole can end up becoming death sentence. Uh, on the other hand, white-collar crimes are abundantly uh, filled with excuses and exit gates and, and ways to explain away your behavior, and we don't spend nearly as much law enforcement efforts to go after this, even though white-collar crime does vastly more economic damage right. than street crime. Absolutely. David K. Johnson, thank you so much for being here tonight. David's latest book is The Big Cheat. Up next, this week's winners and losers in the media. You'll want to see the choices made by the editors of Mediaite. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Time now for this week's winners and losers in the media, as chosen by the editors of Mediaite. And we're joined by Aidan McLaughlin, who's the editor-in-chief of Mediaite, which, like the Law and Crime Trial Network, is part of the Dan Abrams Media Group. And Aidan, for this week's winner, you've chosen NBC News justice correspondent Pete Williams, who broke a very big story this week. That's right. So uh, Pete Williams was the first to report the biggest news of the day, probably the biggest news of the week. Uh, which is that Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer will be retiring at the end of his current term. Uh, the big consequence of that, of course, is that President Joe Biden will be able to nominate the first justice of his presidency. Uh, but it was a huge scoop for Williams, who's one of the best reporters uh, on the Justice Department and Supreme Court beats. Uh, he was the first to break the story at around 11.45 a.m. this morning, uh, and the other networks didn't confirm his own reporting until afternoon. Uh, so it was pretty world-class stuff from uh, from Pete Williams, but I think what we've come to expect, Brian, from uh, from a reporter of his caliber. Absolutely. He's the best. He had at least a four-minute lead on the others, which in the world of network news is a lifetime. Right. Exactly. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, he, he's broken a, a scoop after scoop for NBC News. Um, so, it's, you know, it, it's no surprise that he's one of their senior uh, correspondents. Um, and uh, this this reporting apparently surprised uh, the Justice Breyer, um, who expected to be able to announce the news himself a little bit closer to June, uh, when justices typically announce their retirements. Um, so, you know, some some other reporters said that Breyer was uh, was a little bit upset that uh, he got scooped by uh, Pete Williams, but that's none of Pete Williams' concern. Uh, he got the big story uh, months before it was set to be announced. Right. He continues to be the gold standard for network news uh, coverage 
of the courts and of the Justice Department. For loser, you've chosen Alex Berenson, a once highly regarded New York Times reporter and successful spy thriller novelist. But these vaccines, these mRNA vaccines, the mRNA COVID vaccines need to be withdrawn from the market now. No one should get them. No one should get boosted. No one should get double boosted. They are a dangerous and ineffective product at this point against Omicron. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when we saw this on uh, Tucker Carlson last night, Alex Berenson uh, has emerged during the pandemic um, as a uh, what we call a COVID truther. Um, he's weaved a, a number of conspiracy theories about the pandemic, mostly on Tucker Carlson's show. And when we saw this, his latest commentary last night, one of our editors rolled his eyes and, and thought that we wouldn't cover it. Um, we ended up doing so because I think it's genuinely his most wrong and also probably his most dangerous comment yet on Fox News. Uh, he made two main claims about uh, the vaccines. He said that they were dangerous and ineffective and said that they should be recalled. Um, now, obviously, that's just wrong on its face. Um, he's basing his claim that the vaccines are ineffective on the incorrect belief that they are not stopping infection of uh, the Omicron variant. Um, but new CDC studies and every study for that matter shows that not only do the vaccines prevent uh, hospitalization and death, protect against hospitalization and death, they also protect against infection. Um, even from the Omicron variant, they're a little bit less effective uh, versus previous variants, but they're still better than being unvaccinated. The fact that Alex Berenson continues to be booked on the most watched network on cable news uh, is a travesty for both Fox News and for Tucker Carlson, who remains the only host on Fox News who continues to book Alex Berenson. And it's a sense that there's no shame there about putting somebody on the air who is uh, again and again proven to be wrong. Again and again proven to be wrong and just factually incorrect on its face. Uh, and it's not just that, there's also a lack of accountability um, because executives at Fox News, I know through my own reporting, know that this is wrong and know that it's a problem that they're putting on false information about uh, life-saving vaccines on the air, but they just don't do anything about it because Tucker Carlson is more powerful than the executives at this network. And as long as he continues to get good ratings, I take it he'll continue to have that power. Right. He gets continues to get more than three million viewers a night, which is triple what anyone's getting on CNN. And while that is still the case and while he still has a very powerful audience that will be enraged if there's any sort of accountability, uh, he'll continue to run the network. Right. All right. Well, Aidan McLaughlin, thank you so much for being here. And thanks to all of you also for being here tonight. We'll be back again next week and hope you join us then for Brian Ross Investigates and the Long Crime Trial Network. Have a good night.